Welcome to Acid Horizon, the theory podcast. Today, we are going to break into a text by Marcelo Tari entitled, There is No Unhappy Revolution. This is a book that we may cover over a series of one, two, or three episodes. The essential question that we are going to broach today is, how do insurrections become revolutions? This question has become more important than ever in light of the ongoing global environmental crisis, for example. The urgency of the question is compounded with the idea that we live under a form of domination that does not want to die. And its continuation also means a further downward spiral into existential meaninglessness. So we're just going to kind of start the conversation off informally. Will, what, what is your general impression or take on this, the first couple of chapters of this book? So this text crosses sort of a lot of um, literary spaces in the history of of political thought. But what's fascinating here is that it's attempting to try to provide a further critique of this notion of how constituent power is represented in contemporary political thought. And what I'm most interested in is how, how does uh, Tari's critique of the way in which we talk about constituent power and the supposed lack of discussions surrounding the act of destituting institutions, state apparatuses, and so on, that, that supposed lack. What, what comes to the, to, to the floor when we talk about how a revolutionary act both possesses a, a moment of break, but in that moment of break finds its own end, right? The, the revolution is sort of the end in itself. Because the, the question comes down to the old adage of, are we instituting the end of the law, right? Are we bringing the extinction of these formalized systems to the floor? Or are we just constituting the people's state apparatus? So I think that Marcelo Tari, at least in what we've read so far, is starting to lay out the stakes and sort of the confines of this argument as it pertains to destitution. One of the places where I'd like to start is to really lay out what the constituent act means and then what dis, like uh, destituent power in response to the results of that constituting act mean. First, I think one place where we can start is just how does this form of constituent power arise and then how is destituent power sort of something that springs naturally from it. This book is essentially an attempt to try and um, develop more fully a theory of what he calls destituent power. Um, and Tabi openly says he's not the first one to come up with this concept. Um, he gives you some of the uh, early history of how this starts to make its, uh, make its emergence as a concept in some of the work of Colectivo situ Situationis, I think you how to pronounce it, uh, in, in Argentina, 2001. You have Ma uh, Mario Tronti and Agamben. Agamben's a really, really central figure here. But the most important author, I think, to tie into this book so far is Walter Benjamin, as Will already mentioned. Um, and in particular, um, I'm speaking of Walter Benjamin's Critique of Violence, which is, I have to say, one of, one of the most difficult texts I, I've ever had to read. It, it is extremely dense. Uh, and, and part of the problem is with the translation, um, with the difficulties of translation that, for that text. So Will was wondering, you know, how do we understand the nature of constituent power uh, in relation to this destituent power? By the, the words being used there, it's relatively clear, at least intuitively, what's something about what's going on there. So I, maybe I can phrase this a little bit in terms of Benjamin's critique of violence, where the basic problematic he's trying to understand is the relationship between law, violence, and justice. How do these three concepts uh, relate to each other? And what he ends up doing is critiquing what he calls mythic violence or mythic power, which is two things. It, it's law preserving and law constituting power it's for it's for the violence which establishes law and then the, the, the violence which always follows in maintaining it right and benjamin wants to envision the possibility of what he calls a uh, divine violence which doesn't seek to preserve the law as it is and it doesn't seek to overturn current laws in favor of some some new laws it tries to sweep the whole thing away this divine violence just wipes 
were sort of purified of law as such in, in Benjamin's view. And that, that's in, in, that's just a little bit of a simplified uh, way of putting it, because of course you've got a lot to say about you know, the foundations of law, and maybe I'll say a little more about that later. But for now, the starting point, I think, if we think of constituent power in this kind of power of a people, um, and it's not by coincidence that Tawi always thinks of it in a democratic way, and that it has usually been thought in a democratic way, the, the, the power of a people to constitute a uh, a sort of a form of life, a form, of a constitution, a um, a political, a set of political arrangements, right? And Tabby's trying to, in, in the same way as Benjamin was, but in a slightly different way, um, he's trying to explore what it would look like and why it's so important that we understand, firstly, that contemporary revolts and insurrections, etc., have to be understood as destituent. They're not interested in getting rid of this law or this government in favor of a new law, a new government. He's interested in trying to work through that. What does that actually look like, right? Because it's one thing to have a revolution and replace one government with another one. But Tawi's going to say well, that that historically hasn't worked out hugely well, firstly. Um, and secondly, that, that we, we need to be paying pay, pay much more attention to understanding the role of de- destituent power, but the, the sort of the power of people to simply swipe it all away, put it that way. I, I, I like this... Uh this sort of description because i think it's really important to 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 like because i think the 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 critique of violence as i understand it is like really really dense Mm. but like comparatively to some of the essays that you find in the selected works like relative relatively short engagement right like it like it fits in my it fits in one of my critical theory readers so uh, one of the things that, that i that i find sort of fascinating is the power of 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 destituting comes in like a myriad of forms, right? It can be direct confrontation. It can manifest from desertion. Uh, it can be grounded in an act of fundamental refusal or confrontation. Whereas constituent power must always sort of fall back on its sort of genealogical i don't want to say foundation but developmental track through and from uh sovereignty right so constituent power seems to be at least in this political ontology something that takes up a a pretty consistent form whereas whether it be through crime whether it be through indolence idleness the act of destituting is one that manifests in various ways, but it's always in in response to or always in relation to constituent power. And my question is, are are these things just, is it a dichotomous relationship or rather does constituent power come from explicitly the birth of these constitutional understandings or like the various constitutions, if you want to play the... the the mm. that political game that's as old as I think Republic. Yeah. yeah, maybe just to forecast, I mean, Tari says that they're non-relational, which I thought was a curious claim, and I'm still kind of working on that myself because the his argument in some ways, and of course I have Deleuze on the brain, kind of mirrors the argument that happens in difference and repetition between the notion of identity and difference. It's analogical in the sense that we want to have a definition of destitution that isn't subordinated to constituent power. And we want to be able to actualize that in a political way such that the very things we're striving against aren't re-territorialized on whatever formations created after. It's a question of whether or not, like, uh, to, to, to steal from Nietzsche, like, the rabble is spitting in the wind, or spitting to the wind, right? That, that you toss a rock up in the sky and it must always fall back down into this reconstituted form. You know, in the Deleuzean framework, there is always like a partial reterritorialization going on at any given time. And I, I wonder here if rather than taking that conventional track, the, if, if, because there's a wink and a nod in, I believe, the second chapter to La Prigée's aberrant movements, which is to, to view Deleuze as primarily a, a th- like to take this sort of out of, uh, the framework of just like uh, systematic thought, but instead like system shattering, right? To to really to really drill down on on this sort of Nietzschean 
a notion of aberration of just like complete complete break and i think even just that wink and a nod because i think it's one sentence like a really great analysis of gilles Deleuze, <laughs> you know uh and then moves forward so uh, the reason why i want to uh, pin this down is because i want to understand what non this non-relational entity means because like it is it non-relational in the sense that we get in like difference of repetition chapter five of like differential calculus? Because that's still technically, right? That still technically resembles in a diagrammatic some sort of analogical presentation. To me, I, I just, I want to understand this so that we can finally start to talk about the, the these these places where there there may be tension between all of us. I think one of the things that this text demands both rhetorically and metatextually is that we go native on this concept of destitution without having the notion of constituent power, you know, just sort of lingering in the background waiting its turn. In terms of constituent power for me, it's in terms of thinking about its relationship to law, it's not so much a, yeah, constituent power is always, it's in this, it's caught in this constant dialectic of identification where the people constitute a government or a constituent power is invested with it in terms of how it's represented to constitute a government. And then the constituents, you know, the people it's supposed to represent, get disaffected and they say, well, you know, you're meant to represent us, you work for us. And then, you know, there's a bit of violence, there's a revolution, then they take over and they simply refound the constitution to try to bring it into a fulfillment of itself. But for the law to fulfill itself as the law means really you don't really you're not really supposed to have this kind of coercive force. Otherwise, you're simply reinstituting it. The people stick, and you can see in the spirit of this text not only Agamben and, and the, the autonomists, but also to, uh, to a strong extent Lenin. He relies on Lenin quite a bit here. Although I, I struggle not to see, he, he sees a constituent potential in Lenin because this, Lenin's idea is you know in the revolution is we will essentially render the state superfluous by allowing it to wither away under the force of our collective productive development. But really, I think the best example of such a power, I think, of historically, although I could be wrong and I can have many uh, people with 40 flags in their bios yelling at me for this, is, um, is the, the Petrograd Soviets. You know, the, that was the situation. These provisional governments, you know, it was quite easy to sort of just knock over because it, there was no need for it. It was completely powerless. People were, you know, organizing themselves. They were not being arranged by this power that came in to fulfill itself on the promise of representative democracy after the fall of the Tsar. And of course, then Lenin comes in and goes, no, we are the people's stick. And then um, so all power to the Soviets tends to, to go a bit go a bit all right. But in terms of this notion of law, it's, the idea is to, to render the law inoperative. It's not simply the idea of destroying the law, but rendering it inoperative, to destitute it, to drain it. It's not simply, it's not, it's not putting up a counter law. And to think of non-relation, non-relation to me, I, I read that in terms of non-identity, because if you accept, if you're caught in this dialectic of trying to, uh, you know, you try to bring what's in itself in the government for itself, you try to realize this constituency as properly fully represented, you're never right. going to get that because this identity is always going to be just representation. To bring it into non-relation in an insurrectionary act is to show the point at which this non-identity is always going to be there. And if suddenly if you liberate it from the constraints of always trying to fulfill itself in this abstract and repetitive and representational way, then you can render it, well, if it's no longer, if it's no longer, no longer constrained by the abstract essences of the people it's meant to be representing, then it becomes much more malleable, more plastic, and you can liberate potentials of those kinds of social living which are no longer constrained by the laws of who we think is, is constituting this power, and the laws of the people can liberate new forms of life by simply d taking them out of this context in which you must be what this essential thing is. You must be this constituent power. You must be this constituting thing. You must be a, for example, a, a good citizen, a good patriot, for example. When it comes to this question of how does uh, an insurrection become a revolution, I'm just wondering what his definitions of revolution are. Not be too pedantic about it, but I'm wondering, you know, wh why can't an insurrection just be an insurrection? <laughs> because there's a sense in which... I mean, it's, unless a revolution is just a collective insurrection, because some, otherwise it seems like you know this, this this consolation of different individuals or infinity groups, you know, using each other as uh, force multipliers in an act of comradeship against the dominant power to create their own power outside of this, or if not to destitute them, even to sort of parasitize some of the power out of the regular powers in order to build themselves up for an eventual confrontation in which. It's more political than, than militaristic. I mean, the Invisible Committee say the war against the, the state, well, it's not really a war in the sense of military conflict because the only war, the, the, 
victory over the military can only ever be political. It's not it's not bloodshed for bloodshed's sake. It's in Benjamin's sense a sense of sweeping away the law, trying to avoid bloodshed. It's not this adventuristic, insurrectionary, you know, Mad Max style hell. But to me, I, it, revolution to me always seems about constructing new arrangements. Whereas for me, I, I go I go by uh, or Sterner's sense of um, you know insurrection is is no longer being arranged. And I, 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 I do hesitate when he comes to the Leninist spirit of some of the things he's talking about, where, for example, he says that certain rev, in, you know, revolutionaries must act as if they're not militants. They don't want to become an identity. They don't want to make, you know, they don't want to become professional revolutionaries. They have to, have to act as if they're not revolutionaries in a way, as if this identity won't persevere beyond them so they can't sit around with all their medals in, in the gulag after it's all done and gone, well, we tried, we tried our best kind of thing. And I'm like, this, we can always expect people you know, give people the expectation to, you know, don't, don't get too used to this, you know, but how does that, tra- that's a question for me, maybe it happens later in the book, how does this translate into practice? How do we destitute ourselves not to destitute the very things that we're supposed to be, consi- you know, supposedly constituent of? Yeah, I, I have the same sort of worries on this topic in, in general. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by it for the same reasons I'm worried about it, you know, because on the one hand, Terry says, you know, there's this non-relation between constituent power um, or constituting power and destitutive power, right? They are utterly different and irreconcilable, but nevertheless, this destitutive power must have both a constructive and destructive element. But these are two, uh, it's, it's the, same, the same moment, he says, right? You've got to have both of these things. And then I wonder what the real, if the acknowledgement is that there's going to be, have to be some kind of constructive element in this process of, de- of destituting capital, the state, etc. And presumably that's about developing communal forms of life in line with the kinds of communism and values that we would want, you know, future society to to exhibit in a more generalized and more fundamental way, right? I mean, maybe I'm wrong there, that's, about, that's what it would seem like. If it's, part, if it's meant to be built into a process, then presumably it looks something like that, right? Especially if he's drawing on a, you know, he draws on a gambit a lot, on the importance of forms of life. I guess then I, I wonder... And it's possible that I've misunderstood this, and I'm a you know, filthy bourgeois for not not seeing it. Um, the, the major uh, distinction then between what you find in someone like uh, at least some of Negri's more older work, at least I thought Will might be interested in this passage. He, I mean, I'm sure he'll have read it. Let, let me just read it. This is from um, page five from the the preamble of the book. Tabi writes, "Quote: This self destitution of the militant simultaneously consists of." allowing for the deposition of one's own social identity, the deactivation of the tool of ideology, and grasping the power of that mask, of that particular mode of existing that is militancy itself. It's a form of life one undertakes by performing a very particular relation to one's own role and to the world, founded on a commitment to the truth. And he says uh, it, it's not about political friendship, as he calls it, which is very common, of course, in some of his literature, in Blanchot and others, um, what it's about is the possibility of knowing one's true self. I, I kind of paused for a moment there when I when I read that first, because there's a lot of emphasis on, on presence and being here, and then also this idea of uh, authenticity, of truth, and knowing one's true self. Will, were you a little bit pausing over that one as well? So this is my concern with, with Tari. If one is attempting to extract the truth of the self, right, the question exists to me, though, that the deactivation of the tool of ideology must necessarily presuppose, at least in this framework, right? If we are all worrying about the apparatus, right? If we're all carrying uh, Agamben, Deleuze, and Foucault with us in this analysis, then these notions of engaging in an archive of the self as a politicized subject will always necessarily be bound up in those, what was it, Nietzsche calls society just like a process, bound up in those processes. And I, I just wonder, this commitment to the truth of oneself, right? And this is as far back as the use of uh, pleasures, is always already presupposed by ethical axioms, collective understandings of what a unified constituted self will mean. I'm unsure of where this act of unfolding the truth of one's subjectivity lies in this process, because to me, that's crucial. 
because to me, and that's what that's what Takun is doing, right? There's this frustration with Takun where they're like, okay, so you want us to do this or that? Uh, what then? And their response is, no, no, no. It, it's about it's about understanding one another and and building a community to fall back on. And it's those acts that allow you to do it, right? That proliferate new forms of life. But here, it seems to be, no, you must commit to the truth of yourself and then work for, forward. And maybe there will be some justification uh, in, you know, chapters four and five. Uh, but of course, like whenever anyone invokes uh, the truth of the self, right, there's already, like, that's already such a loaded term that, that I, I wonder if, if you're not running the risk of just replicating, th this will be, you know, the people's state apparatus, right? And he leans very heavily, especially in chapter one, on these sort of metaphysical analogies, you know, invoking the Kabbalah and Pauline Christianity. My radar kind of lit up at that time. The challenge here, and, and I wanted to give it a charitable reading, and I think by truth what he means is, you know, maybe in a sort of Deleuzian reading, are these kind of repressed intensities that don't manifest under constituent power. Does the, is that what he means by the truth of himself? The, the, the question is, is the truth already pre-consummated in some sense before it actually enters into the community and those intensities are enlivened yeah. and <clears throat> there's a sort of collectivity formed? And, and, and that's where I'm somewhat distrustful, I would say. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on the, uh, the, the Pauline angle because the tradition of thinking through constituent power definitely has its roots in contemporary receptions of Paul. And even uh, in, in Agamben's discussion of uh, the situation of power, it goes all the way back to Luther. So Agamben says in Use of Bodies, you know, in any case, it's certain that for Paul, this is not a matter of destroying the law, which is, quote-unquote, holy and just, but of deactivating its action with respect to sin, because it is through the law that human beings come to know sin and desire. And essentially what, what this means is... It's it's taking over. Also, very point Zizek brings up as well, and that these ideas of law breed their own transgressiveness. The idea that it's only through the um, the prohibition of certain kinds of that laws certain kinds of enact that you come to see to generate these desires to transgress them. And if you don't simply destroy them but render them inactive, you neutralize their libidinal connections, you know, by tapping into your little body about organs, as the Deleuze Ogatarians would say it, then you can sort of liberate its potentials to be repeated as something else anew. And this is just not following on from the same Agamben quote. In the case of St. Paul and of the anarchists, in both, you know, what is in question is the capacity to deactivate something and render it inoperative, a power, a function, a human operation, without simply destroying it, but by liberating the potentials that have remained inactive in it in order to allow for but for a different use of them, and I think this, this is this is it's definitely a, a quasi religious, not even could possibly be religious. I don't know Tari's um, theological views myself. Um, in other words, you, you are fulfilling the law by rendering it inoper inoperative. There is quite a not necessarily a, a messianic, but a quite quite a, a Pauline a Christian dimension to this, which I think isn't is something which I think should definitely be engaged with. I mean, you can definitely see this in the work of Zizek as well, but in the sense that he sees the. Um, he also defends Paul quite a bit as long as with Badiou as an elementary thinker of destitution as well as the originary sort of form of uh, the Communist Party when he thinks of the Holy Spirit coming from a Hegelian perspective. Well, I think one of the, the sort of key examples that he goes back to with respect to his notion of truth is this notion of the separation of capitalism and democracy. He says, nevertheless, upon reflection, perhaps the metaphysical separation within democratic modernity, which is caused by capitalism, is no greater than the separation between reality and truth. What is bound up in his notion of truth is that any sort of promise of democracy or liberation that was guaranteed by progressing its extant forms in capitalism or what have you reveal themselves to be illusory in the end. I, I, I've, I've really enjoyed reading. I've been looking forward to it for a long time as well. And um, I've, I've been looking for a, a book which kind of elaborates this this concept of destituent power for quite a while. Um, but, you know, there have been independent um, papers or essays or you know, shorter books here and there. But I think it's good we now have one where we can try and work through what this looks like. Cause, because it's not just about, um, you know, concepts of constituent and destituent power it's fundamentally it's a it's a political question about for communists what is the way forward right how how do we understand our relation to um marx's work to the state to you know the 
base and superstructure to reform and revolution, that's all of these things are always already implied within the question of destituent power, I think. At least at least for Tabi. He's trying to help us think through this, um, through these questions in understanding what a theory and praxis adequate to today should look like. And it's one of the reasons why he's clearly very skeptical about the idea of uh, democracy, although he's very um, very keen on the idea of uh, the commune, right, as a, a sort of model for um, how things, you know, how things ought to proceed from here. Um, and that was obviously something that I'm sure Will Will knew. I'd be reading that with a, you know, uh, quite, quite thinking about that one quite a bit. Um, I mean, all all I, I I actually don't have a long like sort of lengthy response on this. Only to say that um, uh, Tabi essentially makes the argument um, that at this point the idea of democracy is already too tainted, essentially by by its entanglement within global capital, within um, yeah, particularly the capital, but also the violent wheeling of state power, etc. It's too tied up in all of this. And so it's not that he's damning it entirely and he's willing to engage on this point and does for quite a few pages. Um, it's for, for him, there's this question over, is this the right concept for what we need right now? Um, and that, for me, doesn't actually seem to be as significant a problem as others have suggested, because... On one level, that's really a, a, a semantic question, right? I mean, do we call it a democracy or a commune? I don't know, right? But um, one can imagine that many of the features, uh, at least in the kind of authors I, I work with, uh, many of the features between you know, the commune and this uh, radicalized and more meaningful democracy would essentially be, be much the same. Um, and so if I any disagreement with Tawi, it's not that he doesn't... It would simply be that I, I think he's perhaps too pessimistic about this idea. Um, on the one hand, he's going to say that um, if you look at the sort of at least particular last 10 years, I think he says of, of uh, insurrections, um, the only word adequate to encompass all of these is the commune. I think that's a reasonable uh, way to try and capture this. I, I would also argue though, that if you look not only at many of the insurrections we've seen over the last 10 years, not just across the Western world, but also, you know, Middle East as well, um, and even though even earlier for, for centuries, um, the notion of democracy has always been central to perhaps more than any other to many of the most important uh, insurrectionary and uh, you know egalitarian movements that have had some success. And so my only disagreement with, with Tavi on this point is simply that I don't know if it is too tired yet. And I wonder if there's more to be gained by continuing to uh, to think in terms of democracy um, than by jettisoning it entirely. That's my that would be my only thought on that. I don't actually think it's a huge disagreement. It's more sort of terminological one, as far as I can see. I, I, I'm going to try to present a, a slight defense of Tari here on this one because I know you and I have spent a lot of time mulling this over. You and I share this question of whether we cede too much when we just say that democracy uh, is fundamentally already liberal democracy, right? But my question here is whether Tari's position is truly semantic or whether Tari is questioning the social and human forces that presuppose these technologies, right? So Deleuze, in his book on Foucault, writes that all of these machines in Foucault are social before they are technical. And obviously, Tari's book is heavily influenced by both Deleuze and Foucault. My question is, uh, really, when we talk about democracy, are we talking about a place for political expression of one's political will? Or are we talking about an institution that manifests as a result of the revolution's political forces mm. and then solidifies into uh, another yeah. apparatus or uh, space of control? Yeah. In Foucault's discussion with the Maoists, which gets cited, I believe, in Deleuze's conversation yeah. with him on 
uh, intellectuals in power. Uh, Foucault asks a very simple question about the people's court. And it, it's one that stunned me, actually, because it was, it was, I thought it was so silly when I first read it. He said, in, in these people's courts with, with this red army, is there a table? He asks, is there a table? Do, do, does the defendant sit behind a table? And across from that table, is there some sort of selection of individuals who have been uh, sort of arbitrarily selected to adjudicate on the truth of the subject's infraction, but more importantly, the truth of the subject themselves, right? And it's with those sorts of pr slight proddings that I wonder, because Tari toys with this idea of a destituent sort of a, a self-destituting democratic process and then goes, oh, well, it won't work. Maybe one way in which we can say, because I do think that uh, what I have read of this book so far is just fantastic. But one place where I think a, a real project could manifest is, is taking that question, that gambit for a self-destituting uh, populace that operates at some level of collective enunciation and expression that isn't necessarily tied to the institutionalization of political will. And I, I think that's exactly it. Uh, I, I'm sorry to right. cut you off, Will, but like no. I found, I found the section here in chapter two. Um, I was trying to get a handle on his use of the word democracy in this text, mm -hmm. uh, at least as much of it as we've read so far. And it seems that at least for the reader, he wants to put that word out of play, and at least you know, at least bring some skepticism to the term in the same way that Deleuze does, mm -hmm. you know, in his later work, especially in what is philosophy and, and other essays and interviews he did around that time. The section here actually begins on page 28. It's at the end of the first paragraph coming in, in into the page. He says, this is why we willingly sacrifice the truth in favor of democracy, of a reality built on hypocrisy, illusion, and opportunism. Indeed, what could be more undemocratic than the truth? And it yeah. seems at this juncture, he he's opposing those two terms. Yeah. And then the question is, how do we read this term truth? Well, of course, it's in opposition to a kind of doxa that emerges with the establishment of democratic institutions. I think what he's suggesting is when constituent power re-territorializes in the wake of destituent power, what happens is the vestiges of that apparatus come back to repress those very uh, experiences and intensities that were meant to be actualized in the revolution themselves. And then on the next page, yeah. he finalizes it by saying that, and I'm looking at page 29, just at the end of that paragraph there at the top, he says, governments of actually existing democracy cannot do anything but extend and, and intensify the catastrophe underway. And then the, the next full paragraph, I think, is the gem here. He says, without truth, reality is nothing but a lie, just as truth without reality is simply powerless. There is no political or apolitical realist who can deny this claim. Yet who among us thinks and acts, loves and hates by commencing from a truth? What is reality in a world whose physical features are designed by algorithms? And I think the, the word reality here, I mean, of course, carries a disparaging tone, but I think there is a gesture here where he's saying that amidst being a subject rendered into this reality, what's most important is this sort of recurrent, successive, constant contact with this quote unquote truth, which I see as being a kind of difference or a form of power that stands outside of the constituent realm. And I think it goes back to, 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 the, to the old uh, Deleuze quote that power produces reality prior to it needing to engage in repression. Right. Right. And that it is fundamental that power produces that reality uh, before it represses, right? Because it must produce truth before it ideologizes or whatever, right? Uh, it, it, like the act of abstracting and masking can only be success. And this is, this is why I think Tari's analysis is like both like a lucid deployment of these things, but also like a fundamental extension because like before it can even engage in that masking or repressing or whatever, you, or abstraction or whatever you would like to call it, the reality m must already be something within which uh, the, the the subjectivation can take place, where where a subject can recognize itself as so someone that needs to correspond or respond to uh, uh, the the econ essentially the economy is already constricted to, to to Tari. The the limitations of the economy are already present, and that's why I think that. 
this this critique of democracy is is really important and in fact it's it's very close to 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 Tronti's as well i take all of all of this but i i still have a num- number of concerns i guess which i'm hoping you know as we continue to read this book and and discuss it we'll sort of flesh out a little bit more i i would want to know a little bit more about how when he when he writes about and when when uh, you and Craig talk about this relationship between the route reality and truth and living from starting from uh, the passage that Craig gave, you know, starting from a position of truth, right, within reality and live and sort of living that truth, right? What happens when you encounter someone else also living what they take to be the truth, right? I mean, <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I mean, it's, I, I know I, I immediately become, you know, the, uh, the postmodernist here again, you know, the, the, the big T truth. Um, but presumably, we would need way we we all need ways of navigating our lives um based on disagreements with others right um unless the idea is that you know post destitution we actually all agree on everything which obviously is not going to be well, god i really hope he isn't going to go down that route uh, but <laughs> i'm sure he's not going to every community or form of life needs ways of navigating its own internal differences which are always already there right um let alone those those points of contact between uh, communities which do disagree on these different things, um, and then the question is, well, how do how do we do that? And and my answer would be that um, we would need. Well, firstly, we would need to be thinking about that a long time before we even get there. But we'd need to be putting it into practice in in our actual lives as well, um, navigating right. these uh, the, the encounter of difference. That to me, it just just is a process of becoming democratic. If destitu- if destitution is a process of um, not necessarily crushing or attacking directly, for example, the state, right? But if it's instead a process of rendering redundant, right, of, of, of deactivating it, then I, 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 I suppose my argument then would be part of that is going to be us learning to get by in a democratic and relatively pluralist way without it. I think maybe his problem is that, for one, an insurrection is not democratic insofar as a democracy is a situation in which revolution the insurrection, sorry, occurs. But also, I mean, maybe there's just a more underlying sense of trying to shift the semantic idea of what a participatory, interdependent collection of, of mm. autonomous living would, would look like. Yes. Thinking of democracy, you think of mm. demos, the constituency of a demos. And I, I've never met a demos. I mean, we have one in England, and it's, it's a, it, he's a complete arsehole. Um, but this idea of... This idea of rep- rep- Democracy is the power of the demos, the power of his constituents' unified body, this representation. Yeah, I mean, he's going to want to get rid of that. I think. I mean, I've, I've, I mean, you need to get rid yeah. of this idea of the people, because I've, I've never quite, I've never seen one, and we, and we never will. Yeah, but uh, I want to push because, uh, especially given his his relationship to 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 Tronti, I want. I'm gonna, I'll I'll throw in with 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 Matt and give him a little bit of space here. It's the Kratos. Not, 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 not the demos for 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 these these criticisms of democracy because it, it's it's the the state apparatus that Im, that is supposedly one that both imbues and puts over the processes of power over every single person. And the the quote from the the, the Tari essay is uh, because democracy is precisely the process of homogenization, massification of thoughts, feelings, tastes behaviors expressed in that political p- power, which is common sense. So it is only through, and, and I love the invocation of common sense, and I'm sure Craig yeah, will oh, have yeah. a lot to say about that, <laughs> um, that, that it, is the, it is the institution, the apparatus of the Kratos. It is the state apparatus that creates the homogenization, not only of like feelings, expressions, but like our very mode of thought. It, it literally propels an image of thought that we perceive to be something that we all hold. So, in a sense, I actually think it's the Kratos that is the, that is the issue here. The the, the demos, those are the, that could just be bodies, right? Um, I, I I want to see if there's a way we can read Tari as as a proliferation of forms of life against the state apparatus, but one that allows for this sort of pluralistic expression. Um, that uh, Matt is maybe concerned that we lose. Well, I think. Can I just say one last thing there? Just, oh, just go, because go that for was it. sort of put sort of put a pin in it, and then uh, then then I do want to hear hear what you have to say, Craig. Um, sure. One one thing I would say is that um, 
I mean, I, I'm reading and loving this anyway. I mean, I can disagree from a point about democracy and still think there's, you know, enormously valuable stuff going on here. Um, but my my starting point for this is, is is that it's what do we understand by the term democracy, right? And many people I, who I talk to and read will say, well, it, it, it really just is the way in which we commonly understand it, right? It just is um, liberal representative democracy. Um, and you can tinker that with that a little bit if you want, but um, fundamentally... It's just common sense. Yeah, and, I, and, and that's going to come up, and they're going to say democracy is just is what we basically have right now, and that's why we need to get rid of it. And I'm going to say, well, let's, re- let's think about that again then, right? Let's, let's have another think about that then. Um, because I don't think that's all it has been or has to be in the future. And I wonder if... if I think this is a question of, um, uh, is this ground we can... Uh, afford to uh, secede, right? Um, is that is the idea of democracy? Even if you know you you, um, you accept the problems here, particularly when, frankly, I, I would simply say we don't have democracy. That's what that's my be my simple response. Um, we don't have it. Um, but but if we give up give up the, the concept entirely, how much ground then have we ceded, right? Um, to I mean, these these are all, all these political concepts are fundamentally um, contested, uh, politically contested territories. Go you know, go read some Kozlik, right? Like he, he's got loads of great stuff about this. Either we make a claim for it, or, or we don't. And I'm I'm totally willing to hear, uh, hear out Tawi on all these other questions anyway. It doesn't bother me, right? Um, I can go back and read my rants here or whatever, and it's fine, right? Uh, where he, for example, once here we're talking about commonsensical ideas of democracy, right? Like, just accept how things are presented. Rancio identifies democracy explicitly with the act of insurrection. It is precisely in positing, um, positing the existence of a people on, on sort of unrecognized or unseen that democracy comes into being, even, in, even if it's only, uh, for him, contingent and, and often short-lived. So my, my point is I'm happy to agree to disagree uh, perhaps with Tabby on this one, um, but it doesn't affect the validity of so much what, I, what I'm getting here either. Well, what's interesting too is that like this goes back all the way to Republic, right? Where like Plato basically says like, oh, democracy is the one of the the lesser unified, more chaotic because it necessarily leads to uh, these more drone like the the. Those who feel like those of the lesser metals, you know, coming in and basically just thwarting the power of the former oligarchs and literally going after them in this sort of like proto uh, struggle sessions. Right. So so if Plato is able to necessarily see it as this perpetually disruptive and sort of like, of course, it, for him, it ends in like the low hum of tyranny. Um, but uh the, the the question is like yeah there, there there is this possibility but I always fall back on the the Deleuze Foucauldian thing which is like what are the forces that came in and are you sure you're not just instituting you know communist law mm, yeah right that yeah. Na- now it will just be the people's yeah exactly panel, yeah uh, rather than than the scaffold of the ancien regime it's a more uh, democratic death panel me, right. <laughs> yeah, so I, I... <laughs> isn't that what we want? Isn't that what we all want? Really, the uh, revolutionary that, ideal. I mean, we have that in the UK. It's called DNA kills. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! It's staying in, it's in the episode. <laughs> yeah, no, that that that's. Oh no 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 I, no no no! Fuck the NHS seriously. I mean, if you want if you want if you want a if you want like a, a transphobic nationalized death panel, you've got it there. Yeah, and also, uh, like for for me, it, it, it's. The reason why I really I I love what I have read of this book is because I think it necessarily points out some of the problems present in the way in which folks like specifically Michael Hart have started to discuss how to move on beyond, let's say, the black bloc. And it's this desire and this propulsion to say, like, how can we imagine these things uh, sort of constituting their own new mechanisms to proliferate forms of mm. life that we like. And I think Tari's anxiety about assertions like that, I think it's absolutely correct. Yeah. I think I think it's a completely like reasonable. Yeah, I agree with I agree on that one. Make. Yeah. Especially if you 
if you look at the intellectual history of of Negri, where Negri was, you know, yeah. forty years ago on these issues. I wanted, to, I wanted, yeah, I wanted Craig to, I wanted to hear what Craig had to say as well. Well, I mean, we're all kind of circling around the same concepts here, and maybe this will be a kind of good way to wrap up our first um, flyby on this book. The, the central question of the book is, is about the problem with collectives and how they become institutionalized and lose the very experiences that created them. And the, the question of, of revolution is that we, and, and Tari points this out, is, is how to ensure that the potential of revolution is not foreclosed and captured by a notion of government. In the context of this conversation, I, I really liked grabbing onto the notion that the term democracy is deployed as a way, it, it, it basically becomes parasitic on the notion of freedom, or to use Tari's language, truth, the truth of ourselves, um, the truth of revolution in some sense. And I, I even like his attack on, on accelerationism and Prometheanism yeah. here in the sense that, like, look, there's not ever going to be a set of conditions that are going to be amenable to the notion of the emergence of democracy at some future point. We, we have to construct an operation. And, and I think for him, it begins with a kind of existential operation. And there's a quote that he has in the first chapter that I think really hits, hits on this. Mm. And he says, we need to examine our lives more closely in order to extract an image from them and then contemplate it as if it were something like a device or those heraldic symbols that seal the existence of the broke in order to identify that particular moment of existential rupture and all its intensity has marked uh, our individual revolutionary becomings, whatever that might mean for and within our lives. And and the reason I bring in that quote, even though it seems like it's only glancing at this portion of the d discussion tangentially, is that he wants us to develop this sort of recursive function, either as individuals and communities, to examine ourselves for the ways in which the old order or the constituent order Reterritorializes itself upon us, yeah. and he's talking about nothing less than seizing the means of subjectivation here. That's the way that I see it. And how can we, as communities, collective assemblages of enunciation, do that in such a way, such that if any attempt at revolution consummates itself in a better or worse form of whatever we have, that we're able to come back to that in some way. And and I hate to even make that concession because I think that flies in the face of what he's trying to do here. And and I, I'm, I'm really doing my best to go native uh, on, on, on Tari's thesis here because I, I think he has a point ultimately. Yeah. It's like, look, there are certain communities that, okay, yeah, we can become accelerationists, we can become Prometheans, we can become the creative class and the managerial classes and, and try to usher in the new democracy with all our, our fancy technology and transhumanism and what have you. But there are communities for whom there will never be a voice. And, and there haven't been a voice. The historical record proves it time and time again. There are people who are already destituted by the governments that we have. Right. And what mm. can be their politics? Yeah. I don't think any extant form of democracy has addressed that, yeah. you know, in, in its totality. Yeah. And, and that's and that's what I'm looking at here. Yeah. Um, there's a bit where um, it's one of, the, one of the many passages I loved where he says um, he's talking about destituent power and sort of the spirit of, of destitution is sort of animating the animating force of so many of the sort of last 10 years, at least the last 10 years, I think he says of. Uh, insurrections or revolts, etc., and he says that um, there is no more unified subject of revolution anymore. There's no unified class, and he says uh, everyone else is already engaged across the board in reconnecting themselves with that dispersed potentiality through the fragmentary, tiring, and vital reconfiguration of a revolution that is, for a moment, called communalist. The commune and not a uh, and not a commune is a constructive element that cannot be separated from the destructive one through which in our current moment uh, one demonstrates destitutive power, destitutive destitutive power, and that that's sort of the, the draw for me is that you know we we can maybe disagree uh, over whether democracy is the right word, whether it's applicable, whether it's too tainted, etc. But I think I, I think substantively um, I agree with almost everything that I've read so far in in this book, uh, and I would distill it down to that basic commitment, which is that. Um, this is not built overnight through this sort of impatience of the 
revolution in which we take over state power will happen tomorrow and then the day after we'll all be communists, right? Um, it doesn't happen through that. And it doesn't happen through all these piecemeal fucking reforms you get, right, either. Neither of those are going to do it. There's no, in a certain way, there's an ethos here right, I, I, I see of there is no replacement for the long, hard work of building up the kinds of connections that, that we need. It's the same problem Altazer um, diagnoses. What he writes it, uh, it's in the um, underground currents of the materialism of the encounter. He says, he's writing this you know, a number of decades ago, but the problem remains the same. It remains the same problem. All the elements are there. I mean, to couldn't say this as well, the invisible pity. All the, all the elements are there, but it hasn't happened yet, right? Like, so why hasn't it happened? And Altazer says, well, the connections haven't been made between these, you know, these atoms and made to last, right? They haven't lasted to, to have this effect over the long term, um, for this encounter to happen. And that's, I think, the, the animating purpose behind what Tabby is writing here. Um, I'm trying to argue for is that you, you, it, it is about those connections and that has to be involved in a concrete form of life between uh, all the people involved in this. That's, that's what I would extract from that. I think it's absolutely bang on. And this, if I have a question going forward with this book is to think, you know, to as we go through this later on, is you know, where's the affect of uh, of happiness mm. coming from here? <laughs> How do we have yeah. a, a yeah. happy revolution? Because or happy insurrection? Because let's be honest, the very thought sounds miser- <laughs> it sounds very exhilarating, but at the same time, incredibly, yeah, it's it's hard work, and there's it, it's easy mm. to go back into the comforts of little things that you know, capital throws at you, just you know, to keep you just happy enough. Or just, or, sorry, or yeah. just miserable enough, more likely, to not to not do this. And like, and is it? Yeah. How how can we have a happy form of self dissolution? I mean, of course, there's the immediate happiness, no longer having to be oneself, no longer having to have this false identity. You know, Fisher talked about some post capitalist desire. You know, the idea of this identity has been given to you. You're, you're a constituent of this of this uh, society. You are meant to be a good consumer, a good patriot, and then eventually, you know, you're, you're shown this a systemic thing which will never really be fully fulfilled. There's yeah. the ultimate you miserable, and then you go, oh, thank fuck for that. And it's and it's, it's a sense of making the effect of a happy revolution. I mean, it's not going to be – you're never going to give people a certain chance of happiness. Say, oh, yeah, if we, if we all revolt, we'll definitely be happy. But to think about revolution in terms of happiness and self-enjoyment and – even, even possibly even pleasure. I mean, that's something that's quite new because it's always seen as quite a drab. I mean, you, you know, you see a couple of you know Soviet uh, Eisenstein films. But okay, this is quite you know, in a sense. Some people think of it as glorious, but you, it's hard to think of communism as being happy. Yeah, I mean, just in case, just really brief recommendation for listeners. But aside from reading Tavi's book, which is amazing um, so far, at least um, there's another really good book by Richard Gilman Opalski uh, called Spectres of Revolt. Um, he, he touched on a whole range of themes we're talking about already, and especially about the relation between um, the the nature of these revolts, uh, insurrections, and happiness. Like what it, what the importance of happiness and emotion going on there. Um, so just a really quick recommendation there. Actually, if I can recommend a book too, just quickly, um, there's a book by a guy called uh, Johann Kaspar Schmidt that talks a lot about insurrection and. Um, Particularly the role that autonomy and self enjoyment play in that, and it's called uh, the unique and its property. Uh, cool. Check it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, hopefully, we'll encounter some of these issues again when we have Catherine Malibu on. Yeah. Um, when we talk about the concept of anarchy and her most recent interview on pleasure too, and maybe until then we will have our post pandemic trip to the pub where nobody pays. Sound good? <laughs> That's happiness. So, as I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, we will probably come back to this text sometime in the summer. Until then, we do have our episode with Catherine Malibu coming up. Also, an episode on Deleuze and Gattari and the Faciality Plateau. If you aren't a patron yet, sign up because we still have our ongoing Difference and Repetition reading group. Never too late to hop in. All of the previous seminars have been recorded, and I try to do the seminars as a kind of one-off anyway, so come on through. Until then, stay safe.